The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, hello, my name is Carl Fjellstrom. Um, good evening. I hope that this is working correctly now. Uh, hello, my name is Carl Fjostrom. Good evening. And today I'm presenting the Yichang BRT planning, design and implementation, as well as some related BRT corridor improvements. Carl, do you hear me? Yes, hello. Hello, I'm Alejandra. Yeah, that's why I want to tell you. The right. um, rest of the audience is silence, and I will turn off my microphone to welcome you and give you time for presentation. Everybody hopes you like and enjoy this new webinar. Go on, Carl. Okay, thank you. So today's uh, tonight's presentation here, local time, is on the planning, design, implementation and operation of the Yichang BRT, which is a major new BRT system that just opened in China, um, and related BRT corridor improvements. So the presentation will go for about 40 minutes and then be followed by some time for discussion. Let me just see if I can hide this uh, screen. Okay. Uh, Yichang is a city of about 1.5 million people. It's the second largest city in Hubei province after Wuhan. Uh, right, kind of right in the middle of China, you can see there in the map. Um, um, it's famous for, most famous before now, for the Three Gorges Dam, but it's really starting to develop a reputation for bus rapid transit now and for sustainable transport generally. Um, it was an ADB loan fund. It's the first major ADB BRT project. Um, ADB did fund a BRT corridor in Langeau, but that was kind of a suburban and quite a short corridor. Um, whereas this, the Yichang system goes right through the heart of the city. So it's kind of, it's, it's the first major citywide BRT corridor by the Asian Development Bank. And the system opened on the 15th of July, 2015. So I've, I've been discussing with um, Embark for a while about when is a good time to give a webinar. And this seemed like um, an excellent time now that the Yichang BRT has just opened. And I'd like to thank um, Embark definitely for providing this opportunity to present the, the project. So ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, I'm the Regional Director for East and Southeast Asia. And we've had, these, this is a list of some projects around Asia that we've worked on. Um, some open and operational, some still in planning, some stuck, you know, some not being implemented and some in process of implementation. Um, the, in terms of the process, this is a very brief summary. I won't read over all of it, but it's starting with a kind of, a, this is a typical process that we've followed in many cities around the region. So a conceptual preliminary design that could take, I mean, it can be done in six months, um, six to nine months, and around 300000 to $600,000. And what this aims to do, this initial conceptual design, is to provide a really solid foundation for the later BRT implementation. And um, that was the case in Yichang. Uh, I'll talk in a minute about the Yichang schedule itself. So that conceptual design aims to cover all the key aspects of the BRT. So it's 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 conceptual design, so it's not final, but it, it's it. But by covering all the key aspects, you you hopefully avoid this problem. With so many BRT systems in Asia where where they get things key things wrong. Um, engineering design. This, this is typically about a year. It says here six to nine months, but the breakdown between the engineering design and the conceptual design is a little bit flexible. So our conceptual designs tend to be very detailed. Um, so, so that kind of takes some time off the engineering design stage. 
Um, and during and then construction, which is typically one to two years for construction, in Yichang was about one and a half years. In Guangzhou, which we did the planning and design, that was also a little bit less. That was about 14, 15 months in Guangzhou. Um, and, and a lot of things happen in parallel with the construction. And this includes even things like finalizing the operational design, working on the whole institutional setup, all the contracting for operations, the bus procurement, all the communications. That all happens in parallel with the engineering design and the construction. Um, the Yichang timeline, a really key key point for Yichang was when the um, when the the party secretary and the mayor and a and a big delegation of officials and media, about 40 people in total, came to Guangzhou in April 2012. And it's exactly the same as we've seen in in Bogota that mayors and city officials go there and get inspired by what they see and impressed, and they can see that it's a practical solution that can work. And that's what really convinced them to proceed with BRT when they saw the Guangzhou BRT. Before that, the, the party secretary said that you know, he was not convinced, uh, he was not very supportive of BRT. Um, but that visit to Guangzhou changed their thinking, changed their mind. So extremely important. And it's partly why ITDP put so much focus into these kind of demonstration corridors and demonstration projects, because that's what really convinces other cities to, to follow along. Um, then there was a bid by the Asian Development Bank as part of a project preparatory technical assistance. Uh, that was a six months, basically six months, that study, which was pretty compressed time frame for all the work that was done in there in that six months. Uh, 2000 and then 2000, that was the second half of 2012. 2013 was mostly an engineering design. Uh, construction started in the end of February 2014. And then the system opened on the 15th of July 2015. That, that's the first 13 kilometers with 22 stations, phase one. And later, next month, another seven kilometers and 11 stations will open in the north. And then early in 2016, a final four stations and three kilometers will open. So by that time, it, by March next year, it'll be 23 kilometers with 37 stations. Um, some of the key staff, like it's very like in our approach, we we, we mobilise a team of experts and every and a lot of kind of specialised input on different aspects of the project. But that's just a list of some of the staff and consultants we had working on the project. Uh, funders initially the Asian Development Bank. We um, we had grant funding from the Climate Works Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Oak Foundation, and the Grantham Foundation. Um, not necessarily really big amounts. Um, and for different things, like the Grantham Foundation grant, for example, was $100,000 to develop some station area development plans. <coughs> um, and that, I should just mention, that's, that was extreme, a really key factor in the success of the system was that, that we had the ability to follow through with some of this grant funding. Um, without that, we wouldn't have been able to provide the kind of constant supervision and input that is, that's needed to ensure the success of the project. Um, and it's just, it's a key lesson learned really that for anybody doing a BRT project, uh, if for example it's the ADB, then they have to ensure some continuous input um, and continuous technical supervision, um, including really during construction is an extremely important time. That's when a lot of really key decisions are made and some of the original designs might be modified and so on. <coughs> so this is the there's, I mean, I guess it's a BRT webinar, so people already know about BRT, but this problem of, uh, this is in Guangzhou, this picture, it's not Yichan, but this was Guangzhou before the BRT and after the BRT. This was our main experience where we went right through the whole project design from the beginning. It was a very high capacity BRT. So, and you can see here the three substops. <coughs> a substop is a basically a station division. This is one of the biggest stations in Guangzhou, and I'm, I'm showing this now just as a contrast. This is three substops, and this is really high capacity. I mean, there aren't many stations in the world with more than three substops. There's some stations in Bogota with four substops. There's some stations in Guangzhou with four substops as well. But that's really the biggest that you basically need for BRT. Um, but what really that's it's, it's great to have Guangzhou as an example of high-capacity BRT in Asia, gold standard 
according to the BRT standard. But what we really wanted was to have a medium-sized city. So, if, so, so when mayors could come from smaller cities, they can relate a bit more to that if they can see a gold standard medium-sized city BRT. And that's what we achieved in Hichang. <coughs> Um, it's, it's now up to gold standard level. It's the second gold standard BRT in Asia after Guangzhou. Um, so it's very interesting as a project. It's 40 to 50 meters wide, most of that corridor. Um, so from, from this little section in the south is, um, is 60 meters wide wall to wall, that, that little two kilometer section right at the south. Um, and the main part of the corridor here the, which is kind of from the city centre down to the south, that's that's 40 to 50 metres wide, wall to wall. And the north part up here is quite narrow, it's only 26 metres wide, wall to wall. So a really interesting corridor going right through the city centre down to this high-speed railway station in the south. The last station finishes at the newly opened high-speed railway station. It's also kind of a big development area in the south. And the northern part here in Ealing District is a is a is, an, is a very interesting district to the established, but also with a lot of new development up there in the north. Um, so it's it's a really kind of fascinating BRT corridor, uh, and just the, the the layout and the different kinds of urban developments along the corridor, uh, and quite different to Guangzhou, which was a 60 meter wide corridor basically for the whole thing. Some of the some photos just showing the conditions in Ichan before the BRT. Uh, it was not that congested in Yichang, and it was actually surprising that the city officials were able to sh show such a high level of foresight. So they really could see that motorization was rapidly increasing, that congestion was going to get worse, and they took action really at a time when things were not that bad. I mean, in terms of congestion, things were not that bad. But as you can see, it's not just the speed and congestion, but also the general conditions are not very good. Um, not much weather protection there for bus passengers, pretty tatty looking information, um, um, generally quite poor conditions along the corridor, even though the traffic conditions were, were actually not that bad. <coughs> and here's some examples of just the, the, the bus stop, the, the situation waiting for buses. Um, and these are all just photos from bus stops along the BRT corridor prior to the BRT implementation. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to go over just just explaining um, just explaining the different key aspects of the system and and how the planning and design was kind of done. There's a lot of photos and visuals because in 45 minutes we can't really get into a, a lot of detail on the on the design side. Um, so starting with the operational design. <laughs> um, one of the key features of Yichang, which is really a key feature, which is what we've done in all the BRT systems we've designed since Guangzhou, um, is this direct service operations, we call. So it's not really an open system. An open system means that kind of any bus can go in, like in Seoul or in uh, Brisbane, for example, they're basically open systems. Um, so it's not open because it's not open to any bus to go in. So the doors, the sliding doors in the BRT stations, for example, won't open if a non-BRT bus enters a station. There's typically a separate company, a separate a separate regulatory arrangement for the BRT um, compared to the regular bus system. So it, we call it a direct service uh, operations rather than an open a direct service system rather than an open system, and the con it's contrasted with trunk and feeder operations. So and and I, I guess people are already familiar with with the idea. So trunk and feeder is like in Bogota. Um, Curitiba, so you have you have transfer terminals and and terminals at the end of the lines typically, and then passengers transfer to feeder buses and finish their trip. So in Bogota, for example, 50% of trips are are transferring to feeder buses, either to or from feeder buses. So it's a big it's kind of it's a big impact on passengers that needing to make that transfer. Um, and it's a pretty big benefit to be able to do away with transfer terminals and interchanges. And Guangzhou was the first in the world with a high capacity direct service operation. And so it's a, it's a similar model in the same, the same concept in Yichang with direct service operation. So it means the BRT buses go in and out of the BRT corridor. And this is what that looks like. So here the, the dots here are the BRT stations. And the, and the red lines, 
those are the BRT routes, where the BRT routes go. So the BRT routes go all around the city. The first section here is the first 13 kilometers which opened in July. Uh, that's 22 stations, 13 kilometers. And that's just showing the full corridor that will be open by another seven kilometers opening in next month and then another three kilometers in um, early next year. And those red lines again are where the BRT buses go. So the BRT buses go in and out of the BRT corridor. So what you can see, um, uh, basically all those red lines you can see, they cover pretty much cover the built up area. It's, it's, it's quite well covered by BRT routes. Um, even in just the phase one BRT and the phase two corridor in the north, um, we get we almost get citywide coverage. So some this you can get this from worldbrt.net. These are just some basic information about the system, um, some of the operational parameters, and the, um, so let me just just mention a few. So I've mentioned the number of stations. The speed is about 20 kilometers per hour now, and that will increase. Uh, they still haven't finished installing all the lane dividers and there are still a few signal changes being done, some U-turns being cancelled. Um, that will improve the speed. So we expect the speed, the peak hour speed, to be up to about 22 or 23 um, shortly by the end of the year. Peak passenger throughput, 5,400 passengers per hour per direction, 94 buses per hour in one direction, gold standard, the, as I mentioned, the second system up to Guangzhou. Um, 240,000 passengers per day. That will increase quite a bit. Uh, we expect that to be to be well over 300,000 by the time the that north part of the corridor opens. Um, so flat fare of um, two RMB. Okay. Let me see. So. Uh, there's a discount for 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 smart card payments, so 1.6. So nearly everybody uses smart cards. 200 BRT buses, uh, special BRT buses. That's 170 12 meter buses and 30 18 meter buses. So we design the stations to accommodate both 12 and 18 meter BRT buses. And there's also a fleet of regular buses using BRT stations, and that's 162. <coughs> so in total, that's 362. BRT buses and 200 of them are the new ones and gradually the more new buses are procured and the use of the regular buses is phased out gradually that'll be that'll just that percentage the proportion of special BRT buses will increase um, average bus occupancy 57 it's not particularly crowded like that's uh, uh, say compared to Guangzhou for example um, but that's really one of the big benefits of the Yichang design which I'll explain is that is the system has a lot of capacity for growth. So definitely it can be at least doubled quite comfortably the demand uh, within that design. And that's a key factor. It's a key limitation in a lot of BRT systems done in Asia is that even shortly after opening, they're already at or over capacity. And that's obviously not a good situation to be in. Um, so the doors, the, the special BRT buses have doors in both sides. This now, this used to be a bit new. I think now that's becoming more and more common to have doors in both sides of the bus. 35 centimeter platform height. So what that means is that the BRT buses use the, can use doors in the left side in the BRT station. And then when they're outside the BRT corridor, they use, bus, they use the doors on the right side, just on the curb side. Um, so in future, that's just becoming more and more normal to have doors in both sides of the BRT buses. Um, and it's excellent, gives you a lot of flexibility. And we'll, we'll see in a minute how that works in the stations in Yichang. Um, what else have we got here? Let me see. So CNG buses, Yutong. Um, okay. It's not, it's not quite as good as Guangzhou in the sense, uh, Guangzhou was a great model. It was the first system in China to have more than one bus operator. And that took us a while to convince Guangzhou to do that, but it was, it's really a good model to have multiple BRT operators. Um, in Yichang, it's more typical of the other Chinese cities, other Chinese BRT. There's just one, one um, municipal bus company that does the BRT operation. And that can actually work quite well. There are, there are some cities where that doesn't work well, and there are some cities where it works very well. 
and a lot really depends on the performance and the attitude and the, the professionalism of the of the bus operating company. And fortunately, uh, Ichang has an excellent bus operating company. I mean, very very impressive really from the beginning of the project, the the Ichang, and probably the most professional you know bus company that we worked with in in terms of BRT planning and design in China. Um, here's a I put in bold in the middle of the screen there the a, a, a summary of the capacity of different BRT systems and using a kind of a something that something that I developed not particularly uh, it's a little bit of a new approach of thinking about design capacity um, and the key factors being uh, overtaking lanes present um, is there more than one stopping area in the stations um, and then looking at the actual throughput of the stations and then they're, they're just mentioning what year that count was done. Those are all counts based on actual field counts that we've done. So the numbers are very reliable, the field counts. Um, so what you can see, for example, in this, according to this classification, Yichang is a high capacity design, high design capacity. The actual operation capacity now is pretty good, 5,400. That's, that's basically what the model said it would be. It's, um, and that will increase, we expect that to increase quite a bit in coming years. Um, initially, this year will increase quite a bit when the, when the new section of the BRT corridor opens. And then in coming years, as, as there's a lot of development, both in the north and the south parts of the corridor, the central part is already kind of fairly built up. So that number could, could go up to up, up towards 10,000 or higher in, in, in 10, 15 years. And the design can accommodate that with that high capacity design. That's how, in terms of peak throughput, that just means if you stand on the side of the road and count how many people are going in a single direction uh, past a single point uh, on BRT buses per hour, that's that number. Um, so the biggest in the world, Bogota, um, and Ichang around 5,400. So it's it's a uh, you know, reasonable number in terms, it's, it's kind of medium capacity throughput now, medium volumes of throughput. And that will increase uh, initially, as, as I mentioned. Um, so in terms of city centre buses per hour to per direction is quite high in each other, 94 buses um, per hour in a single direction. Um, so, uh, and that compares, yeah, that compares, um, well, that's, that's pretty high compared to most other BRT systems around the world, really, 94 buses per hour in one direction. Uh, as I mentioned, the occupancy is still pretty low, relatively low. 57 is the average occupancy, so there's lots of lots of scope to to kind of increase that that demand. Uh, and speed is is pretty good now, 20 kilometers per hour. But we expect that will improve when the lane divider installation is finished and when some signal changes are made. So right now it's around 20. That should get up to around 23. Um, fairly soon and there are some express routes there's already one express route that was implemented and some more being added and those express routes will help to bring up the average fees as well so in terms of the process uh, I, I, I will show quite a few slides and and I think this will be available as a recording so people can go back and have a look in more detail for those who are interested rather than explaining it all now um, but the basic approach to developing the model is something that we did in Guangzhou now and in and in several cities, um, this approach of developing a model kind of based using the the existing bus demand as a kind of as a starting point to build the model, and then various other inputs, then developing the model and then uh, calibrating the model and then then applying the proposed BRT network using the model, and then coming up with fleet requirements and and route adjustments and demand time savings and so on. <laughs> Um, so a big, I mean a lot, the, the data collection was done very intensively. So we, at that time we only had a really short time frame to do the study. So there was a, there was initially a really, we, we did a very intensive set of surveys over about three months, or actually less, actually over two months um, in 2012. And then we, and <coughs> what we do then is to develop a zone, in the, in the modeling approach we have a zone allocated to each bus stop. So each each bus stop and each BRT station then is in a different zone. 
Um, so then we that that allows us then to, to get good allocation of demand to BRT stations. Um, and then we updated the data we did in 2012. We updated with a big round of surveys in 2014, and that was interesting. We saw a 20% increase in boarding between 2012 to 2014. And that's something quite typical in China and a lot of Asian cities. I think at this time you have you can you can see some pretty big increases in demand and in 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 um, both in demand and in things like fleet composition, in car ownership. It's just at that time when you see some really big annual increases in in these parameters and congestion suddenly starting to get much worse as the car ownership you know, increases very rapidly. So the surveys, boarding and lighting, as well as the onboard counts, which are done just on board, getting boarding and lighting combined with bus speed. Um, we also did counts at bus stops, and then um, boarding and lighting at stops per hour. Those green dots you can see there, so boarding and lighting, you can see the concentration of demand. Like one big concentration is that downtown area in the middle of the map there, it's the downtown kind of city center. In the south is this east railway station, uh, a kind of a new, big new developing area, and up in the north um, is another, another district up there that the BRT corridor connects to. So just zooming into the central area there, frequency occupancy surveys. Okay, I'll move over this a little bit. Frequency occupancy, zooming into the central area, bus frequency, bus speed. Uh, initially, the bus speed was much better in 2012, and we saw a big degradation in speed in 2014. Um, some of the updated frequency counts, transfer surveys, okay, bus routes and stops, okay, and then we come up with the OD. So after this modeling procedure, which is done in a really um, short time frame, I mean the whole thing we did, the surveys and the modeling was, was in about two months, two, two to three months, probably three months. So it's a very, very kind of, um, it's, it's a good approach really that in terms of getting some quick results for a conceptual design. And this is the breakdown of the OD. So here you can see that this is the total here. Um, and these numbers here are hourly AM peak, hourly morning peak. So you see that the demand in the city center, but also in the north, significant demand than in the south. And the percentage here, so O inside, D inside, so it means the trip is coming from one BRT station to another BRT station. That's pretty high, actually. It's about 22%. That's much higher, for example, than in Guangzhou. It was less than 10%. Um, origins inside, destination, so coming from a BRT station and going somewhere outside the BRT corridor, that's 17%. Um, origin outside, so starting outside the BRT corridor, over here, and then coming some and then a destination inside the BRT corridor, so inside the BRT station, 12%. And O outside, D outside means that it's going from, it's going through the BRT corridor, but starting, the trip is starting outside and finishing outside the BRT corridor. Uh, that's quite high, 50% of trips. And this is just a breakdown there showing the different types that I just explained. So origin inside, destination inside, inside outside, and origin outside, destination inside. And again, you can see the importance here. See the BRT corridor is that line, that maroon line. So the direct service operation was really important to enable us to, to serve this city center area. Because otherwise we're, we're slightly on the edge of this main CBD area. So it's very important that the routes can come into this area, and that otherwise the demand would, if we if we were not able to do that with this direct service operational model, there's no way we'd have 240,000 um, passengers per day. So fleet calibration as well, um, modeling on the on the, the the fleet requirement. As I mentioned, it's about 200 buses. Um, now, we in the model we said that 190, 187 were needed. Um, but there's a but there's a bit of flexibility there because we, we can use some existing buses as well in the BRT corridor. Um, and this is the list of stations here and the saturation. So 0.4 means 40% saturation, and that's our design target. So we don't want to exceed 
40% saturation. And the saturation is just the percentage of time that the station is occupied. So occupied by buses slowing down, stopping, opening the doors, boarding and lighting passengers, closing the doors and departing. That, that percentage of time, so 1,400 out of the hour, out of 3,600 seconds in an hour, is 40% saturation. And with that level of saturation, you get quite good speed, you get low queuing, uh, good performance for the BRT. And here, this is using primarily 12 meter buses. So it's important to note that in future, the stations have been designed for 18 meter buses as well. So what one very easy way to increase capacity in future when it's necessary, if saturation starts to increase at some stations, is just to increase more of the big buses, the 18 meter buses. And that automatically has a big, causes a big reduction in saturation. Okay, so the model, we modeled here around 5,000, it was about 5,100 was the model peak. And the, the actual performance we've got in operation now, because the routes are slightly different, is 5,400. Um, per hour. So pretty good results in terms of the modeling the, the actual outcomes. And quite significant demand up here in the north part of the corridor. That's just zooming in. This, this is the south part of the corridor down here. Um, so the fleet, 187 uh, special BRT buses and 142 regular buses we said were needed uh, during the modeling process. That was in 2012 and again 2014. So, and it's important to note the on the operation is on my last point on this, and I'll get to the some other aspects. But the it's important to note that um, that you need to adjust. So I, I think I better hurry up here. So that these you, you, we have to look one by one, and we're doing this. So looking at the corridor and looking at where we can reduce transfers and some different routes that can be proposed. To, to reduce transfers, increase speed, reduce saturation at some key stations. And that's something that's, it's a little bit on hold now while, while we're waiting for the new section of the corridor to open. Here's the station that, that I mentioned here. This is that the particular, it's a, it's a pretty revolutionary new design. This was, um, this came from Pedro Sars initially. Uh, it's been done in one station in Sao Paulo that we know of. And then in Landro, we did it in about six or seven stations in the BRT corridor. And this is how it works. So it's, we call it a directional BRT station. And the benefit of this, um, this is the station in, in operation in Landro. And it works very well. It works really according to the theory. The benefit is that it's got practically the same capacity as a two substop station, um, but only half the length of a traditional offset BRT station with two substops. So I'll show how that, what that means in a minute. Uh, here's the station operating in Lanzhou. That opened in 2012, the Lanzhou system, right, right at the end of 2012. Um, so you can see here the, the buses, the BRT buses here stop on both sides of the platform. So on one side using right-hand side doors and the other side using left-hand side doors. Now this is this is looking at in Ichung. So this was part of our initial design. If this is this design on top here is two substops offset. Offset is because the, the road was a bit narrow there, and that, that whole corridor was a little bit narrow, like around 40 meters wall to wall. So you, we didn't have space to put facing to put a central platform or facing split platforms uh, with overtaking lanes in here. So this so it had to be offset. So an offset two, this is a more traditional, the one on top. So just offset two substop, and the substop there, each orange space you can see is 20 meters. And the gray space in the middle is 15 meters, and 10 meters for fare collection at the end here. Um, so that 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 becomes pretty long, two substop offset there. That's about, what is it, 20, 40, 60, 80, yeah, it's about, it's more than 200 meters long. All right, the, the top one. Now the bottom, now the bottom one is this new directional design, and this practically has the same capacity. I mean, it's slightly less because you get a little bit less possibilities for express routes, but it's 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 essentially the same capacity um, as the one on top. And you can see the benefit in terms of fitting this into the 
corridor. I mean, the, the big station here goes all the way to the intersection. You don't really have, we don't like that. We like to reduce the space of the BRT at the intersection. Um, so we, it's it just this, this option, uh, this directional design gives you a lot of, it's, it's got a lot of appeal in terms of um, being able to fit the corridors into the station. We'll see in a minute what that looks like. I'm going to move along a little bit faster now. Um, these are some typical cross sections in different parts of the BRT corridor. Um, mostly the at grade station access, this is the directional design. So each of those orange parts there is 20 meters, so 40 meters. So that means that two 18 meter buses can stop. That's the capacity, two 18 meter buses can stop on each side. So it's got capacity to handle four 18 meter buses stopping at the same time and boarding and alighting in one direction. And this here is the 26 meter wide corridor up in the north. This is, this is the north part that is quite narrow. This is a bit different here. So the station here doesn't have overtaking. It's just more traditional central platform station, five meters wide here with the, and the BRT bus doors only in the left-hand side. That's for this 10 kilometer section in the north that's opening soon. <coughs> Um, and that matches that. That's the that's the photo from a couple of weeks ago. That with that that location there, um, and that that matches the demand levels in the north. Without the overtaking, um, it's it's a good match for the physical conditions as well as for the demand. Here's a rendering, and that was uh, a, again a couple of weeks ago. The construction. This part of the corridor will open next month. The intersections here. So the stations located away from the intersections is a really key point. Access is predominantly at grade, so street level access to the to the platforms. There are six or so bridges and tunnels, but those green dots you can see is street level access to the BRT platforms. So again, typically the stations located away from the intersections, um, and the intersections are all simplified down to two or three phases. Often that's combined with the U-turn that's that is again combined with the BRT station access. That's a very good design that works well. Uh, let's have a look. That's during construction. So the whole corridor really was reconstructed. That was in uh, April 2014. Um, just showing some photos um, of the BRT under construction. Um, okay. Uh, the signage installation here, very good quality signage. Um, some of the landscape, so uh, part of the architecture work, like we did all the work on the BRT station architecture um, with an Australian architect, Derek Trussler, who we, we use in basically all of our projects. Um, and yeah, part, part of that was looking at some landscaping opportunities, putting some greening into the station areas that worked very well. Um, some of the architectural concepts here that I, I better just move over here. Um, quite a major, you can imagine this is very important in BRT that to have a good planning and design because this is a major project on, on the main road in the city, um, excavating the whole thing and you know very big impact. So I think it's great also for the ADB to have such a successful project. Um, because you can imagine if it if it had not have been done well, it, it could really be a mess. This is during on the opening day. Some photos from the opening day. Here's the BRT corridor. You can see the stations. This is kind of in the city centre area. Um, this is the directional BRT station. So see one and two. Some some buses stop on the right and some stop on the left. And you and for the passengers, this design is really interesting because you don't need to run up and down the station between sub stops. You get on, your, your bus typically is either here or here. Um, this is also a queuing area behind, so four buses can stop at the same time. But it's, it works out very well for passengers here because the passengers just kind of need to wait around here and they can easily access any route. So some photos of the corridor. Um, <coughs> this is a very typical design here, just the street level access uh, to the station. Uh, very convenient for, for passengers. Some of these these dividers are still being installed. So right now it's not really ideal. Um, but that in, the, the dividers, will, when they're eventually installed, they'll be on the outside of the BRT lane. And the reason some buses are leaving here, because this is the last station in the corridor, the, the first the part of the corridor. Um, some bridges uh, that have escalators, the escalators are still being installed. 
Um, the 18 meter buses, so three doors on each side of the bus. 12 meter BRT buses, um, two doors on each side of the bus. And so this is like in the curb side, you just use the regular right side doors. In the BRT side, we use the left side doors. Um, and there's, there you can see the two 18 meter BRT buses stopping at the BRT station. So, so that gives you a really high capacity design. You've got two 18 meter buses on this side, two on the other side. So four 18 meter buses at the same time boarding and lighting. It's a, it's a high capacity design, even though the stations don't look that big. So especially compared to Guangzhou. So inside the stations, this is some of the regular buses. So you're using the right side doors. So because, because the BRT buses have doors in both sides, so they can use both sides of the platform. Um, and the, the regular buses have only right side doors. So they, the regular buses use this side of the platform. The express route was just implemented. So this, this saves a lot of time. Um, this saves about 10 minutes per trip. The express route skips about 10 stations and uh, along the corridor. Yeah, just the passenger waiting environment is definitely much better, especially in the wind and in the in the sun and rain. Um, there's also like little areas there where you can lean, kind of leaning bars there. Okay. Now these are the lane dividers, a little bit like in Bogota, that are being installed. Um, bus route, quite good mapping and information. I want to show now. I'm just going to scroll over. Um, some pictures showing some of the communications work. One thing that Yi Chang really did that was very impressive was really excellent outreach and communications to the public. And that started really early in the project and gradually got more and more intensive getting closer to when the system opened. These are all information displays in the main plaza of the city. Um, the traffic police were very cooperative in, in the intersection changes and giving information to people. The media were invited along for several trial runs. Here's a press conference that was done during the planning. A lot of good media, you know, newspaper coverage and TV coverage. Um, this is driver training, so the, the big driver training and practicing activities there. Um, trial operations, some of the information kits <clears throat> for the opening day. Um, this was volunteers, so there were about 5,000 volunteers that, that helped to, to explain to people how to use the system and everything on the, on the, on the, in the first week of operation. So these were the volunteers. Um, the developers are really on board with the BRT. So you see the BRT being advertised here. This means the BRT first station. So the BRT is advertised here a lot. Um, I'll show some time series photos here, just showing the construction in a few stations. They're kind of interesting to see how that progressed. And the construction typically is done, I mean, first on one half of the road, then the other half of the road, then the, and ideally with kind of, without too much um, negative traffic impact. So here's another location. This is Gurdjieff Bar at the end of the corridor. Um, some trees were taken out in some, for some temporary widening, but then those trees are getting put back in. So 700 new trees were planted along the corridor. You can see the conditions for crossing. It's much better with the BRT. So really a lot of new safe pedestrian crossings uh, that came in with the BRT. Shanzhuang Lu is another location. Um, a lot of effort was put into keeping the trees as much as possible. So um, Okay, last one, so okay. All right. So the operate the, the, in terms of the institutional setup, it's it's very impressive in Yichang the way that the the project was implemented. I think it's a great model for other cities. Um, they set up a working unit quite early in the project, and that working unit seconded people from various related agencies. I don't really have time to go over that now. The cost is about seven million dollars per kilometer, six to seven million dollars per kilometer. It's mostly from an ADB loan, the financing. 
Last point now I'm going to get on to is just, just to mention, I don't really have time to go over, but just to mention some of the other projects along the BRT corridor. What Ichung really aimed for and what we aimed in working with them is not just for a BRT, but to really to have some kind of transformational urban project. And so along the BRT corridor, uh, we looked at all the BRT station areas and identified lots of projects and improvements that could be done along the BRT corridor, improving access, um, covered walkways, intersection improvements, uh, some landscaping this is an example of a one station in the city centre just doing some landscaping improvements and covered walkways um, that right now is typically used for this kind of, that was used for this kind of setback parking. Um, parking reform, so I'm going to just hurry along here because we're getting to the end. Um, but Ichung, this was very impressive, they eliminated 500 um, setback parking spaces. Setback is the space between the front of the building and the edge of the walkway. So they eliminated 500 spaces along the BRT corridor um, and this is what it looked like kind of before and after in the same location. So you can see it's it's much more it's exactly what we're aiming for, much more than just a BRT project. This is typical the the parking here, see before and after. Um, so it's got parking reform um, um, and where the parking was kept on the setback, like here, it was better regulated and arranged here, so it didn't block the walkway or the bike lane. Um, a lot of NMT improvements ongoing in Ichan. So there's, great, there's a greenway network being implemented. There's, I mentioned some trees planted. There's 29 new safe pedestrian crossings and 400 bollards along the BRT corridor, preventing vehicles from encroaching on the walkway. There's a bike sharing system that will be implemented by December. It's already in implementation now. There's bike parking being implemented under construction at BRT stations. These are some of the colored bike lanes at intersections being installed. Some of the segregated bike lanes here along the BRT corridor. Um, okay, a car free day. So Ichung really got on board with the car free day. And this is the vice mayor and the heads of some bureaus that came out on 22nd of September. Um, for the car free day, they closed a few streets and had some activities promoting that bike sharing system that will open in December. Um, those green dots are where the, where that will be implemented. So 27 stations initially with 645 bikes that will be operational by December. That's kind of under implementation now. And lastly, I won't look at these. Uh, I'll stop. We've got to leave some time for some questions. But um. Um, but we've already started this impact analysis, something we did in Guangzhou and Lanzhou as well. And right now, because the BRT system just opened and it's not really fully complete the whole first, the whole section to the north. Um, so that'll, that'll become clearer over time, the impact analysis. But you already see some pretty interesting changes. The top graph there is in the BRT corridor and the bottom one is from a control corridor. So a non-BRT corridor we did for comparison. And you can already see in the first round of surveys after the BRT opened in some of these questions like how do you rate the bus service, how do you rate the bus stop stations, you see a kind of a big jump in the very positive, you know, in people with a very good impression um, and a drop in the people with a bad or very bad impression. Um, um, even just after kind of the first the first um, section, but that, that's something that will become clearer over the next year or so, that impact analysis, we can see those results, but it, it's some quite good results initially. About 20% of the trips would have used another mode if the BRT um, would have used a, a car or a taxi, it's about 20% um, if the BRT hadn't been implemented. So that's a pretty impressive kind of mode shift to BRT. A reduction in bus vehicle kilometres, reduction in waiting time, Big improvements and more is ongoing because some of these improvements are still ongoing, especially for the bike facilities. Um, but already quite a quite a good jump. A lot of progress for more improvement, but quite a good jump um, in in how people perceive bike facilities and pedestrian facilities in the BRT corridor. And that's it. So I'll, I'll um, go back for some questions. Thank you very much. And those are some links um, that that have more information. Carl, thank you. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yep. Thank you very much. I enjoy really your presentation. I everyone has in the chat the option to ask you questions. I don't know if you are seeing the questions in your panel. Uh, let me just. Are you seeing the questions? 
I think I can see it. Let me just open that up. Yeah. No, I can't see questions. Oh, questions. Hang on. Mm -hmm. No, I can't see any questions entered here. Hi hey everybody, if some, someone has a question, you can send it by the chat. Um. Oh, I, I realize I had to go over that kind of very quickly. Um, um, but I think really I definitely would recommend anybody who is, is working with a city that's interested in BRT to, to come to Ichang or any BRT experts or anybody working on BRT, it's definitely worth a, a visit to Ichang. And we're very happy to help with the logistics of that. And that website I mentioned, the sitevisits.net, that website has, um, has information also about a, a program. We can also arrange people to meet city officials um, to get technical briefings. That seems to work really well as a way to kickstart some BLT projects in other cities. Carol, I think if someone has a question, can he, they can send it to me or to BRT and I can send you after to have the answers in our website with a recording of the session if you like. Because I can see if anyone has it. I can see your side of the chat with questions so oh. you know you're seeing I, it. I, I can see something now. I'm just trying to open the uh, to open that, but I can see I can see a question. What percent of their route do the BRT lines typically spend in the BRT corridor versus local streets? Um, I would have to check to get the exact percentage in Yichang. In Guangzhou, it's about 30%. And I would guess in Yichang that it's something similar. So typically around 30% of the route, on average, is inside the, in, inside the BRT corridor. About 70% is outside. And that varies per route. So some routes are 100%. There's two routes in each and there are 100% inside the BRT corridor, um, only two routes. And there's 20 routes that are, that are both inside and outside the BRT corridor for varying percentages. But 30% would be, a, would be a, is, is, is roughly 30%. There are, is there another question? We are we have five, five more minutes. If anyone wants to ask something else, meanwhile, nobody's. Um, while we're waiting for some questions, possibly, um, I can't see any more right now. Um, but I had to. In the end, I had to kind of rush over the the whole presentation of the BRT station area development. But that's something that um, I didn't, and I didn't really make some closing observations on the experience. One part of that, ex well, there's a few, I think, conclusions we can draw from Yi Chung's experience. Uh, firstly, is that it's really, it really pays off, and this is something that was done in Bogota and in many other cities to look at the BRT as an urban development project and look at the BRT corridor as an urban development demonstration corridor, and use the bit, the opportunity of the BRT to do bike sharing, to do greenways, to, to do NMT improvements, to do landscaping improvements around BRT station areas, to reduce the off-street parking requirements for new developments around BRT stations, to improve the on-street parking management. Um, it's so, there's so many opportunities to, to make improvements along the whole corridor, and that really works. Um, it's something we did in Guangzhou as well. It's It's been done in Yichang. Um, we worked a lot on that in 2014, but it was hard to get much traction because everybody was so focused on the BRT implementation. So kind of another little lesson learned there is in some of those things, you're probably better off waiting uh, until after the, immediately after the BRT opens to really push on some of, some of the things. Um, 
Um, like, for example, the BRT station access improvements. It was hard to explain to people why they needed ac these access improvements to the BRT station when it's just under construction. But after the system opened, that becomes kind of obvious to people um, that the access improvements have a big benefit. And I mean, again, on, I, I guess because I don't have any other questions, so just a couple of other observations on that. Um, oh, hang on. I I think I see some, maybe there are some other questions. I'm just trying to figure out how to scroll down there properly. Okay, there are. Sorry, I see some other questions. I, I'll get to that. Um, did you do anything for the buses outside the corridor? Uh, not really. Not really. I mean, um, always with BRT, like, one of the great things with BRT is that you can, you don't need to fix the whole, every problem in the whole city. You know, so it just it becomes a kind of a more manageable thing that you can do. So and 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 you can do it step by step. So eventually, when you have more BRT corridors and the the BRT fleet becomes bigger and bigger, you will eventually cover much more of the city. But initially, we didn't do much for buses outside the corridor. So we didn't work on bus stop improvements for for non-BRT buses. We didn't really look much outside the corridor for the buses. We did look outside the corridor for the NMT and bicycle improvements in some of the TOD issues. Um, how did you recruit 5,000 volunteers to help launch the system? Um, that was a big, the Chinese cities are very good at mobilizing thousands of people. That's one thing they do very well here. So there was a call for, there was a, so they had a, yeah, there was a, a big promotion run by the bus company at that time to recruit volunteers. And the volunteers actually got some, some, uh, a lot of them were students and they got a, some nominal, yeah, it was, and, and they got some nominal payment of costs and that was actually done through the youth union, right, of the, some of the, the, the party set up in China. Um, so the youth union is able to mobilize them, their numbers, mostly kind of um, young people and, and students. Um, so have transit signal priority measures been implemented along the bus routes? Um, no, not really. We, we don't need transit signal priority. Uh, all we did was to change the signals to two phase and three phase, and that was something we had to do one by one for each signal. Um, but the general approach is to is to have look at the traffic circulation, reduce the phases to two and three phase, and make sure we get a good percentage of green time for buses, because we have say 94 buses per hour per direction um, in the peak hour in Yichang. So. It doesn't, you don't really need, in that situation, signal priority is not really relevant. Like, you, you, signal priority is more where you have very low frequency and you want to, you've got a bus coming every two minutes and you want to make sure that bus gets through. But in, in each one, we have a bus every 40 seconds or so. So no, no particular signal priority was necessary, but it was very important to change the, the phasing along the corridor. Our left, another question, our left turns um, allowed across the BRT corridor? Um, in in about six or eight locations, I think it might be six locations now that you do have left turns across the BRT corridor. That's it, so mostly not, but in some locations, yes. And that's purely just the local, that particular uh, location at, at some of the intersections that we had to allow left turns across the intersection. There was no real option in terms of the road network, um, or there were particular topographical issues. So generally, there's not, but there's still six or six or so locations with left turns across the, across the BRT corridor, and those are three-phase intersections, uh, a few of those, and they, they work quite quite well. Um, so we don't have any like, major black spots along the BRT corridor in terms of speed. The main problem in terms of speed is there are, they ended up putting in uh, too many kind of U-turn locations, so there's actually, some of those can be taken out. Um, I think that was the, uh, uh, some more questions actually, let me see. I think that might be all um, in terms of the, I think that covers the questions. Apologies to, uh, f if, if I missed any questions. And I couldn't see the names very clearly, so also apologies for not mentioning the names of the people asking the questions. Well, if there is another question I can send it to you during the, well, our afternoon tomorrow for you. Thank you, everybody, for being here in this session. Carl, thank you very much for giving it. I enjoy it very much. I think everyone everyone does. So we will send you an email 
if you need something, if you have any doubts, send me an email or ask in for the BUT Center. We will upload the recording in between this week and the next one. So if you have some friends or someone that couldn't make it today, you can tell that there will be everything uploaded in our website in a few days. And thank you very much, Carl. I think if you want to say a few last words. Yeah, thank you very much for the once again, and and we we're very happy to uh, host anybody that would like to visit Ichang and learn more about the project. Thanks, thanks again. Well, that's all. Thank you very much, everyone. Carl, you are you have the power to turn off everything. <laughs> okay, great.